Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you everyone for coming after lunch. I hope you, um, you have a nice full bellies as opposed to me. <laughs> um, so, I just got to grab my slide. So how might we manage medico-legal risk in digital health while supporting person-centred care? Where might the potential tensions lie? What am I even talking about? I'd like to start by first acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we all meet today, here in person on the land of the Gadigal people and virtually throughout the country. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. The concept of person-centred care describes care that's focused on the person and driven by their values, preferences and wishes, of course in the context of their needs. We heard earlier about what's important to consumers. Person-centred care lies at the core of clinical governance, which I like to refer to more broadly as care governance because any care or support, including through technology, has the potential to impact a person's health and well-being, and ultimately their clinical outcomes. But what if a person's values, preferences or wishes, such as the way in which they choose to engage with technology, invite the risk of harm or undermine best practice and therefore create a medico-legal risk that turns back on us as practitioners or hospitals or vendors? How do we manage this risk? This ostensible tension while simultaneously supporting person-centeredness in the context of health technology? I think the answer goes back to fundamental principles of communication and consent, informed consent, and the components which link in with these principles. Let's just start by considering what clinical governance in the context of health technology means. And of course, we've had a lot of discussion around this already today. Uh, as we know, there are lots of definitions of clinical governance out there. Uh, last year, I decided to make one up for myself um, just by looking at the ordinary meanings of the words as, as I use them to try and simplify things. I'm not sure I succeeded, but let's see how it goes. If to govern means to control, regulate, direct or oversee something, and include self-governance, meaning how we control or regulate our own conduct as individuals. And clinical, very broadly, refers to the assessment, management or support of a person's health to achieve optimal outcomes. Where the concept of health is very broad and where outcomes very much encompass the experience of care, as we heard this morning, then in the context of health tech, which is not always about providing clinical care in a traditional sense, clinical governance refers to how we as organisations or individuals control, regulate, direct or oversee the use of technology to assess, manage or support a person's health in order to achieve optimal outcomes for them. Ultimately, clinical governance is about the person rather than being driven by the developer, vendor, or even clinician. The only person who really knows what a good experience is for them is that person. Of course, technology is, oh, pardon me. Technology is an integral part of our everyday lives and an integral part uh, of care. Amongst other things, it presents opportunities and choices that can enhance person-centred care, whether through a person's engagement with their health information or the use of apps or wearables or through AI. As we've heard today, technology empowers people to actively participate in their health and well-being in a way that wasn't possible in the past. Person-centred care requires not only that we understand the needs of the person receiving care, but how to align that care with their values, preferences and wishes. Which including with technology, requires flexibility. It means partnering with people when providing care or support in whatever form that is, whether that's whether they're patients we're treating or consumers we're supporting in aged care, disability or other services, or even the Australian community at large when designing new technology. So while we deliver, while the way we deliver care continues to evolve through tech and innovation, 
The underlying principles of care delivery and clinical governance should remain constant, as Erwin Lowe uh, indicated earlier. Now, what do I mean by medical legal risk? Medical legal risk essentially encompasses legal risks associated with the delivery of care, traditionally medical care. We expose ourselves to a claim in negligence if we breach our duty of care as clinicians or hospitals or vendors, and if we cause harm as a result. Medical legal risk can also arise from the way we conduct ourselves as practitioners or vendors, and we might be subject to complaint or investigation or sanction, even if no harm is caused, for example, if we deviate from an acceptable standard of care. We might also risk breaching the law as set out in legislation, such as privacy. Medical legal risk and clinical governance are interrelated, in that medical legal risk actually arises from poor clinical governance. And poor clinical governance, including a failure in person-centred care, will create medical legal risk. And this is no different when using technology in care. Let's just look at a, a simple example from 2019, when a doctor who ran a weight loss clinic by telemedicine was found guilty of professional misconduct. Amongst other allegations, he'd failed to perform any physical examinations of his patients or take adequate histories through his phone consults. So in essence, the doctor failed to deliver person-centred care by not ensuring he had an adequate understanding of his patients or the risks when prescribing medication to them. In another example relating to AI, uh, a hospital in the US, which some of you might have heard of, decommissioned a sepsis alert tool after recognising that it had been trained on data which didn't match the clinical demographics of patients to whom it was deploy uh, deployed. And this was in the context of the pand uh, pandemic. So a failure to be adequately person-centred when developing or deploying technology, including in the collection and application of data, might not only undermine clinical governance, but also create a medical legal risk through a risk of harm. But we do need to balance person-centredness with our duty of care. In South Australia, the coroner recently de uh, delivered a finding, also in relation to a teleconsult, uh, over, the, over the death of uh, Ms Weeks. Ms Weeks had had a recent history of bowel obstruction due to a hernia, and during the early months of the pandemic, she sought a consult from her GP for vomiting and abdo pain, which by default at that time was a telehealth consult. During the phone consult, the GP invited her to attend the clinic for a physical examination, but she declined, believing she just had gastro and just wanted a script for anti-emetics. The GP took a history and agreed with her self-diagnosis, after also excluding a hernia by talking Ms Weeks through a self-examination. Sadly, Ms Weeks died the next day from complications of a bowel obstruction. Now, it had been Ms Weeks' choice not to attend in person, despite her GP's suggestion. Therefore, while a person's choice underpins person-centred care, sometimes that choice can create a risk of harm, and it's our duty of care to manage this. On the other hand, this duty of care must be balanced against a person's dignity of risk, which is our right as competent adults to take on risks which we understand and accept such as a teleconsult despite its potential consequences or its potential inadequacies in some situations. So how do we achieve this balance? How do we manage this tension, particularly in the context of health tech and innovation? In Ms Weeks' case, the coroner believed that if the GB had advised her to come in, she would have, and she would have then received appropriate treatment for her recurrent bowel obstruction. So it's important to ensure a person's choice is based on robust advice and, of course, to communicate that advice. So in my view, the key to managing medical legal risk while supporting person-centred care, regardless of context, is grounded in communication. It's well established that communication reduces the risk of claims and complaints. Communication is, of course, essential to inform consent, which is a component of our duty of care. And this requires a two-way discussion, including listening to communication from the patient. This is so we can ensure that informed consent encompasses those risks which are material to a person. The concept of material risk was defined by the High Court in the landmark case of Rogers and Whitaker, 
and this is as follows. A risk is material if the circumstances of the particular case, um, in, the surface, in the circumstances of a particular case, a reasonable person in the patient's position, if warned of the risk, would be likely to attach significance to it or if the medical practitioner is or should reasonably be aware that the particular patient, if warned of the risk, would be likely to, to attach significance to it. What does this mumbo jumbo mean? Well, it means we really need to be discussing those risks that might impact the individual's decision in the context of, particular circum of, of their particular circumstances rather than be generic in our approach. Some of you might know the facts of Rogers and Whitaker, uh, which illustrate this concept really well. But for the benefit of those who don't, uh, Mrs. Whitaker was blind in her right eye from a previous penetrating injury and relied entirely on her left eye for vision. She um, underwent surgery to her right eye to remove scar tissue with the aim to improve its cosmesis and hopefully restore its sight. Unfortunately, not only did the operation fail to improve vision in her right eye, it caused inflammation in her left eye, impairing its sight and leaving her almost totally blind. Her surgeon, Dr. Rogers, hadn't warned, had not warned her of this risk because it was so rare in the order of one in 14,000. And on this basis, he argued that a responsible body of ophthalmic surgeons would not have warned her of it. However, the High Court determined that no matter how remote, the risk was material to Mrs. Whitaker. It made a difference to her in her circumstances, and she would not have proceeded with surgery had she been aware of it. Therefore, Dr. Rogers had breached his duty of care and been negligent in not having warned her of this risk. In a recent class action, the federal court applied this test of material risk in finding that Ethicon had negligently failed to provide adequate warnings against a range of urogynecological uro devices. Specifically, it was considered that consumers are in a vulnerable position and depend on the manufacturer and the doctor to provide enough information to enable them to make an informed decision about their treatment. So you can see the law also takes a person-centred approach and to that extent aligns with clinical governance. The legal requirement of informed consent supports autonomy and self-determination and is therefore fundamentally about person-centred care. Let's consider a couple of illustrations of how communication and informed consent might support person-centred care in technology and simultaneously manage medical legal risk. My health record, which thankfully is not this, allows people to manage their own health information. For example, a person can choose whether certain information is uploaded to my health, my health record at all. However, with this person-centred function comes the risk that their medical records will be inadequate or incomplete. Not only is this contrary to principles of good record keeping, but it carries the risk of harm such as through inaccurate assessment of a patient due to missing information. But it's a risk that the law allows a person to take and to that extent supports their dignity of risk. But as practitioners, it's our duty of care to maintain adequate records and also a professional obligation which is essential to good clinical governance. We expose ourselves to medical legal risk if we don't keep good records. So how might we, we, how might we, um, how might we resolve this tension? Again, perhaps through communication. If a patient refuses to have certain informa information uploaded to their, my health, uh, to their My Health record, which is quite important, you could explain the potential consequences of this to them, such as the risk of a misdiagnosis or a missed diagnosis. Uh, as we know, consent also applies to privacy, so this would ensure an informed refusal of consent to share information. If you're treating someone with reference to their My Health record, you could ask them, if there's any, any information that's been withheld and document their response. The scope of your duty of care is only in accordance with what you could have reasonably known at that time. So it's important to, to document what you know, what you don't know, and what was communicated to you. We might also see a tension between person-centered care and medical legal risk uh, with apps and wearables, which enhance consumer engagement by empowering a person to monitor or manage their own health. We heard about the Fitbit example earlier um, from Louise Schaefer, uh, as well as other risks associated with technology. 
So vendors should ensure that they communicate potential risk with their product, such as required in the Ethicon case I mentioned earlier. And these would include risks associated with user error. You might also warn consumers maybe not to rely on your technology without guidance from their doctor or, or that it should only be used as an adjunct to clinician input. A study published in 2020 by researchers from Macquarie University identified a range of risks associated with consumer-facing apps. In, relations, uh, in relation to apps that are in use, the authors of this study suggested clinicians might take part in, in evaluating the apps, Clinicians have an important role in identifying potential and emerging issues with, te with technology, and they can do this in partnership with their patients. Review the literature, because it's always important to stay on top of best practice. Discuss usability preferences with patients to ensure they make informed decisions when using the app. If clinicians can engage with technology and understand the risks associated with them, as with any, in any innovative treatment, such as a new medical device, we can help patients be adequately informed and appropriately engaged. It doesn't mean we need to understand exactly how the tech works or all the risks, but we should have a general understanding of potential risks that should reasonably be within our knowledge. In some circumstances, we might not have a complete understanding of the risks, in which case we should communicate this to our patients and partner with them in exploring and assessing potential risks that might be material to them. This might entail an evaluation of their digital literacy in tandem with their health literacy. Uh, health literacy. So going into the future, taking, taking a digital health history should be just as important as a person's social history, as we've been, we're trained as doctors to do. What health, te uh, what health technology, if any, does your patient rely on? How do they use it? Is this use appropriate for them? Alternatively, what are the barriers they face in, in using technology and what, risk, or what risks does this pose? You might assess your patient's socio-technical circumstances. For example, they might not have uh, reliable internet in their location. Shared decision-making within the therapeutic relationship also brings shared responsibilities. We've heard that clinical governance is about relationships and responsibilities. So clinicians have a role in reminding patients of their responsibility in using tech so they can agree the extent of guidance a patient might need outside the tech in partnership, in partnership with them. This will help manage expectations of both patients and clinicians so that they can agree appropriate strategies together. Aligning these expectations and strategies can manage medical legal risk. The importance of communication is supported by a Dutch study uh, recently, which concluded that prescribing digital health requires an excellent communication process to support patients in the process of understanding, learning, and adopting digital health. This paper recommended communicating a range of issues to patients, uh, intended use, patients' responsibilities, risk of adopting digital health, how patients should respond to uh, unexpected situations, conditions under which to access the device or app, as well as security advice, and how to discontinue the use of digital health and what alternative treatment options there are. So as we look to the future and embrace innovation, we must also look to the past and remember fundamental principles of clinical governance with an understanding of how the law also supports person-centred care. In the context of, in of innovation, I believe that communication and informed consent remain the stronghold of person-centred care and medical legal risk. So in summary, person-centred care, including in health tech, requires effective communication. Informed consent through effective communication supports person-centred care. Therefore, established principles around communication and informed consent should scaffold person-centred care. These principles will simultaneously support clinical governance and medical legal risk, including in the realm of technology and innovation as the landscape continues to evolve. In conclusion, in conclusion uh, I believe there's no actual tension between person-centred care and medical legal risk. Uh, to quote myself again, sorry, <laughs> um, 
Understanding clinical governance in the context of a medico-legal framework such that individual practitioners understand their duties and obligations whilst always remaining focused on the patient rather than practicing defensively will support safe, effective and person-centered care. In this way, the medico-legal interface and clinical governance are intrinsically aligned. And this applies not just to health practitioners, but to all of us who support care delivery within our various roles, including in technology. Thank you for listening to me today, and thank you to the agency for having me. Please feel free to connect. Uh, oh, do we have any questions? Surely, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Tan? Yes, George. Hi, thank, thanks, Melody. Great talk. Um, back in the late 90s, when Sydney University was moving to graduate medicine, they were looking for two criteria in doctors, empathy and communication skills. From what you're saying, they still remain key skills. H have we maintained those skills in our team, or, or have we sort of lost some of that art in going forward? Thanks for the question, George. And you did promise you'd ask one, <laughs> so thank you. I'm going to like to see people hold, hold their promises. Um, so you can only lose something if you have it in the first place, right? So in answer to your question, I'm not sure we ever really truly had it. Authentic patient, person-centered care is a hard thing to achieve in practice. And I can talk about it and talk about it. Um, and, and I'm really trying to remind people about it all the time, but I know how difficult it is in practice. And, and back in 1997, George, when I was an intern, the one thing that really ran through my mind most of that year when I saw doctors arguing, everyone arguing in the hospital, was, I don't understand this. This should be about the patient. So that was 1997. <laughs> I would like to think we've improved rather than, you know, got worse. Okay. Oh, okay. Can we train it? Or does it help? That's a. That's a, well. Uh, I'm not a psychologist, but uh, look, I, I would like to think we can train it to some extent. Certainly, I think that sort of initial vetting process, that interview, you know, understanding what brings people to medicine in the first place, what motivates them in the first place. Um, if you know a prospective student came to you and said, "Oh, because I want to be really rich." then eh, they might not have the, you know, yeah, that might be alarm bells. So, uh, so I, yeah, I think it's a bit of both. The Pro problem is we're actually training our students on how to pass those interviews now as well, so it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I'd like to think that as, as educators, we can really start to ingrain this way of thinking right from the beginning. Yeah. And if early on a student thinks, this isn't for me because I don't care, <laughs> then they'll have the opportunity to, to do something else. Um, hi, Melanie. Thanks for your um, presentation. I suppose I'm, I'm thinking um, from the point of view as a practitioner, a GP, is part of the problem in the, um, in the digital sphere is that things are evolving so quickly mm. that legislation, guidelines, standards aren't really keeping up. Mm. And so I suppose I feel perhaps a little bit uncomfortable with your comment there about a patient coming in with the apps and all of these things and being expected to be on top of that, to understand it, to know whether it's a good app, whether it's reliable, and perhaps being judged on giving incorrect information. I sort of would like to hope that legislation and guidance in the app developers might be helping out in that sphere. Yes, I, yes, thank you for that comment, um, and that's really important and, you know, it's, very, it's a very complex issue to explain in, in 20 minutes and, and, as I said just now, a lot of these things I say are much, much, much easier said than done. Uh, but I guess the, the, the message is our duty of care is to act with reasonable care and skill to uh, avoid or mitigate the risk of harm. That's a minimum. So what is within our... Um, what's reasonable for us to know is not going to be everything, you know, and that was clear from the Ethicon case as well. I, and the part of the problem is, as you highlight, is when regulation doesn't keep up with what's happening, and as clinicians, you've got to keep up with the regulation and the different apps, and how do we, you know, match it all up? And I think it's really important that our professional bodies give us guidance in this, and um, and I'll say add contemporary guidance and have that guidance constantly 
updated uh, uh, rather than rely on guidance that's from even last year, which might be outdated by now. So it's kind of all working together. I think someone said earlier, clinical governance is about acting as a team, and we all have a role in clinical governance, whether the whether the oh, sorry, whether we're the regulator or um, or you know Apple or <laughs> or professional bodies or whatever. We all have a role in this, and this is why I think you know we're all here today to ensure that every single one of us who are somehow involved in health tech think about this all the time. Uh, it's not easy uh, and, and you know you can't possibly keep on top of every single product that's out there but if you don't know also you know I think it's important to be transparent with the patient to say look I've never seen this app before I haven't heard of it I'm not sure it's even used in Australia I'm not sure it's suited to the Australian demographic it might have been designed for a different demographic so it's really important to explain to patients what you don't know as well so they're still making an informed decision so they might say, I don't care, I still want to try it. And that's, that's their choice, that's their dignity of risk. But as long as you help them understand what those potential risks might be, mm. what those harms might be. I hope that helps. Um, thank you. Please put your hands together for Dr. Thank Melanie Chan. Thank you. Thank you.